Matthew chapter 6, if you are there already, verses 1 through 4, Jesus says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Now, if you stopped right there, that would be enough. It would be an obvious teaching. It would be an encouragement and a challenge to us as well as a warning. But he doesn't. He elaborates a little bit. It's, and, and he elaborates in a way that we might uh, make this in, in today's sermon an application or an illustration or an example. So it gives kind of an example of what is for apparently for them a primary issue, a concern of the heart. And he says, verses two through four, thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That's not a terminology we typically use. And in verse 4, he says, So that your giving may be in secret. And your father, here's an encouraging side of this. Conversely, your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Now, <clears throat> which would we rather have, man's praise or God's? That's a rhetorical question, too. We're going to explore this text a little bit this morning, but go with me to the Lord in prayer and try to pray with me, not just hear me this morning. And uh, ask God to open your heart, to look into your heart and see if there's something that needs to be dealt with there. Heavenly Father, we do come before you again in Jesus' name. Uh, Jesus told us that we could come directly to you through him. And so we do. And the answer to the question about why we do what we do in this text is obvious. And yet... It is still problematic. Uh, we tend to make ourselves our own God. Now, Father, help us to resist that temptation. Help us to see you as our, our only audience and do all that we do in Jesus' name and for your honor and glory and not for ours. Please move in our hearts and in the end help us to see that you gave very openly and yet in humility. And that gives us life. So please bless our time in your word this morning. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In Matthew chapter 5, we saw a right kind of righteousness. The Beatitudes, Jesus says, you've heard this and I say that, and he fulfills the righteousness of the law in, in truth and in purity, not just in religion. Yet in verse 6, we have the opening of, of chapter 6 with this, this tendency to do a religious things wrong, a, a wrong religion, uh, if you will. It is a real privilege for us to be able to give or to be able to do. And some people are more financially gifted. God's just gifted you that way. Some people are um, more um, spiritually gifted in the sense that they have um, gifts and they don't have any money. Um, and I don't know what the case might be with you, but whatever it is God has given you, God expects it from you. And, and, and you really kind of, you kind of rob God when you don't give to him what he says to give to him, don't you? I mean, like, if, if, if Ephesians 2, 7 says that in the ages to come, he might share the exceeding riches of his grace and his time, kindness toward us through Christ Jesus our Lord, right? I, so if a person doesn't get saved, and they know they should, 
don't they effectively rob him of glory that should be given back to him? It's kind of like taking the mirror away from the light that's shining down on the diamond. The diamond doesn't reflect back the light in its beauty. And in effect, they're stealing from God. We are expected to do righteousness. And, and, and in reality, sometimes our righteousness is seen. So, so this text is not in conflict with what Jesus said, said in Matthew chapter 5. Look in Matthew chapter 5 with me, beginning in verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. So the, obviously Jesus is saying that you and your light cannot be hidden. You shouldn't be under a bushel. You should be on the top of the hill. Nor do people set a light on a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to the whole house. Everybody can see. In verse 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others. So Jesus isn't saying, well, don't really, let me take that back. They, they, they can both be done. We can let our light shine, but the question becomes, why am I letting my light shine? Why, if I'm doing something in public, am I doing it for the public's uh, accolades, or does it just happen to be something that I'm doing and it's in public? In verse 20, Chapter 5, Jesus says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is not a works based salvation text because righteousness is not um, developed or created in doing works, righteousness is manifested in doing works. It's just like we tell people all the time. We don't work to be saved. We work because we are saved. And again, I'm just going to say this. I know I've said it before. If you would do well to sit down, and whether you do it at one time or get out your concordance or do it over a week, read the New Testament and just notice how many times the Bible talks and affirms and confirms and um, compels us to good works. Never for salvation, but it says we're called unto good works. We're supposed to do these things. As we look at this text, I want to ask you um, two things. One, um, is our giving, and that's the, kind of the example that's given here in verses two through four, or doing... Um, genuine. Is it genuine? And then two, ask yourself, is God the object or the audience of what I'm doing or giving? So I might give to a poor man, but am I giving to the poor man or am I giving back to God through the poor man? Am, am, I, am I painting the wall down in the new CE building if, so that Phil will be happy with me or somebody else? Or I'm, I'm doing it for God and Phil happens to be in there painting too or whatever the case might be. Who, who's your audience? Ask yourselves these things as we look at this sermon, the sincerity of our faith, part one, and then this one, it deals with our charity or our giving as an example, but it's really our righteous deeds. So let's give a little bit of a background to the text. In the, in the King James, you see the idea of giving alms or doing alms. And that's the example that Jesus is giving here in verses two through four. 
okay? So what is this? Well, the idea of giving to the needy is, um, is, is a, a religious act. It's, it's something that you do. You, you literally just give to people in need. You are uh, helping the poor. Jesus said, the poor you have with you always. So uh, it's good to, to give to people who are in need, whatever the need might be. We can extrapolate from this that there's other areas, not just money, that people have need of. Um, I remember in Ghana, West Africa, um, many years ago, that the, the, the Muslims literally encourage um, the poor to basically what we would think of as panhandle. And the reason that they do that is because in a, in a primarily Muslim environment, it gives the other Muslim an opportunity to gain a work, to, to build his good deeds as opposed to his bad deeds. So you're encouraged uh, whenever you see a poor person to go and give them something because it helps you out. It doesn't help us out, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. And if you have something other than a King James, then you probably see the idea here of doing righteousness. And so we're going to try to fold both of those um, uh, concepts into the message this morning because we're doing righteous things, but the example given is doing alms. So doing alms was common in, in Scripture. You see this very often in both the Old and the New Testament and it kind of was a practice of righteousness. Um, it, there was a, a practical benefit for the receiver of it, and then there was a spiritual benefit for the giver of the alms. Uh, it was a demonstration, if you will, of one's charity towards God uh, and the recipient as well. In Matthew chapter 26 and verse 11, this is where Jesus says, "'The poor you have with you always.'" So if you want to give to the poor, you can do it. And, and, and you know, if, if Jesus is true, and I believe he is, if he says the poor you're going to have with you always, I'm pretty sure we're always going to have poor people. Amen? So if, if, if that's how you do it, they're not going to run out. If salvation is not by works, it is with this basic understanding that we, we, we get this, this text given to us. So what is Jesus teaching in this text? Well, number one, Jesus is giving a command. You don't see it as you read it in the English, but this phrase, uh, beware or take heed, is a present imperative. So it, he, he's commanding this to be done, and it's an active, so it's do this, do it now, and do it always, okay? So as, as, as often as you can or as often as you do, you should do this, but you should do it in the way that he's about to describe. And that's where the conflict is. I was telling my wife the other day, um, it might have been yesterday, we went to Frankenmuth and um, I did something for somebody and I knew I was running a risk by saying this, but I just... I was trying to provide a teachable moment for my wife. And, uh, and I said, you know, I didn't mean it that way. <laughs> Where's my water? I, I was just, honestly, I was trying to just provide a teachable moment. And, and I said, I said, you know, it, it just, it, and, and this will resonate with some of you, maybe many of you, hopefully all of you. It does feel good to do good. Doesn't it? I mean, if, if you're like a person who likes to just, just do good for people all the time, whether it's opening a door, I always tell people, I'd rather cut your grass than cut mine. You know, it just feels good to do good. And then she quickly um, responded with, yeah, as long as you're not trying to be seen by other people. So there went my teachable moment. <laughs> just, you know, I lost that one. But I really was just trying to, because I knew what I was preaching today. And this was, it was fresh on my mind, okay? So um, Jesus says, do this, it's a, it's a present imperative, do this, do it now. Um, there can be some genuine concern, though, in, in what we do or in what we give. 
So Jesus elaborates on this verse one and verses two through four. And he says, look with me again in verse two. So that thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be praised. That's their motive. That their, their conduct looked genuine, but their heart, which people could not see, betrayed them. Do you ever feel that tension? That when, you, when you're about to do something good and you feel like if I do this and people see it, what are they gonna think? Or do you I think when you go to do it, if I do this and other people see it, what are they going to think? You see, there's two, you can say the same thing and mean two different things by it. I don't want them to think that I'm doing it for a wrong motive, though they might. I really want to do this in a right motive, but what if they see me? Well, if they do see you, and even if they criticize you for it because they misunderstand your motive, do it anyway. It's always right to do right. Amen? It's always right to do right. And you know your heart, and you should keep your heart in check. And this is what this text is helping us do. We should be doing our, our, our acts without any kind of fanfare. Breaking that down a little bit. The idea of seeing here in verse 1 looks, it means to look closely at or to wonder. You know, how, how does God see this as opposed to how you see it or others might see it? And, and he uses an example here, and, and it may be that the Jews understood this better than we do. He says, uh, uh, talks about sounding the trumpets, and, and maybe there was, a, you know, some people gave a trumpet or a bell at the time of giving, and so that you, people would see you uh, doing that, or it would bring attention to the act that you're about to do. You know, we have in our custom uh, a saying that we say, well, you know, you're tooting your own horn. Do y'all say that up here? Do we say that up here? So, you know, you might toot your own horn about what you did or what you're going to do, and that seems to be the idea from this text. But avoid attention. Be casual. That's the idea of not letting your one hand know what the other hand is doing. It's, it, it's, it's the idea really carries the weight of to readily uh, forget the act, uh, what the doer is doing or giving, to readily forget it, to, to not make much of it. Now, wouldn't it be good if we all did good and just didn't make much of it? It's just what we do. Wouldn't that be? Don't you wish you just did more good without even the temptation for the fanfare? And then he says it's going to be rewarded. Now, now this is where it starts to have its value or lack of value to us. And there's several contrasts, as you've already seen in this text. So th this is going to be rewarded. Whatever you do, whatever you give is going to be rewarded. But the difference is... Is it going to be rewarded by man or by God? Man's going to see it. And man might think much of it. Is that enough for you? Is that what you were looking for? Is that what you wanted? Or are we doing it to and for God and he rewards? Look at verse 3. But when you get to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your father may see in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Now there's a difference between rewarding and receiving. Receiving by definition is what you, you, you get. It, it's, the, the word is like pay. It, it's the just amount. Whereas reward in verse 4 is to give away or to recompense. There's two different words here. So the idea is it, when you give, 
You get a receipt right then and there if you're doing it for man's eyes. You get your receipt, that's what you've got, there's nothing more to it, one and done, that's it. Conversely, when we do things for the Lord, not for man, God gives us abundant and beyond uh, it, it, to be rewarded genuinely and spiritually in eternity brings on far greater rewards. You know, Jesus is very clear about the kind of rewards that we get, that moth does not eat and rot, uh, rust does not corrupt. They're, they're eternal as opposed to temporal. So you're really kind of giving away the store if you have a wrong motive. Now, I know the tendency might be, well, let me be selfish and let me um, give things to God so that I'll have uh, an eternal reward. Well, you, you still gotta be careful of your motive there. Is your motive to get a reward or to do good by God? He's gonna honor it. Just do good by God. But that's really got to come from the heart. So do we want to ask ourselves, do we want to be paid now by man or rewarded later on? And Jesus uses a word here in our text. Look back at verse 3. But when you give, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So verse 4, giving, uh, so that your giving may be in secret. You get the idea here, but in verse 2, he, he, he says something about the person doing the giving or the doing. He says, Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do. So right there, we are identified as genuine or hypocritical. And the word that's used there for hypocritical is a word we might use for an actor, someone playing the part. Have you ever um, had like a favorite actor or you know somebody that you really like as an actor or an actress and then you find out that they do something unethical or immoral and you kind of feel let down. You know, it's like, oh man, I really thought he was a nice guy, or she was. A, I think about that Laurie girl uh, a few couple months ago who uh, basically cheated to get her kids in school and all that. And yet, you know, she played all these. What's this Love Channel Day Spring or Life Spring or whatever it is? You know, there's, you know, it's that, that all the movies are the same, and they just have different names. And in like four minutes, you can tell the plot. You can tell who the foil is. You know, you know all about it within like four minutes, but your wife wants, or you want to watch it anyway. <laughs> right? So Laurie Laughlin's playing this sweet girl. She's the fender of the poor and the, and the downcast, and she's kind of the stable rock in her little country town up around Canada. And all of a sudden, man, she's not so sweet and pristine as I thought. She's an actor. She's doing what she does well. She's fooling people. And she does it well. That's why she probably gets paid good money to put her kids in school. She's a fake. We're a fake. If we're not doing it for God, we're acting. We're, we might be deceiving them, and, and we're deceiving ourselves, but you're not deceiving God. This is why with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Because if you just made the prayer and you say, oh God, please save me, or whatever it might be, and it's just a prayer, like a work, and the heart's not involved, it's not genuine. Salvate, you can't fool God. When you call on God to save you, He knows whether you're genuine or not. 
He knows whether your prayer is sincere or not. You, you might fool the crowd. You might fool the preacher. You might fool your family, but you don't fool God. Whether that's for salvation or giving or doing. You know, there's a reason why many churches, and I'm assuming we do here, I know I hold this philosophy. I'm assuming that Hunter's Creek does too. We don't have names on the sides of pews. We don't name buildings after people. And we don't name wings after people and things like that because we're not doing it for them or even because of them. We're doing it for God. I don't want to rob somebody. You know, if somebody gets $20,000 towards the CE building program, I don't want to rob them of that blessing, that, that, that glory that God can give them far better than I can. You know? So we don't do that. We, I'm assuming we never have. And as far as I'm, as long as I'm here, we won't do it. So... Do we give to the attention of, of man or, or, or to God? I, and I'll just be transparent. I'm going to give you an example by transparency. And I probably shouldn't say this because if, if you have a negative thought towards me, then this is only going to make it worse. But, no, I mean that. Um, like, sometimes I will, I, I get here pretty early on, on the Lord's Day, okay? And I might see something that I just don't like. I like, you know, there's bark on the, on the walkway or I see weeds sometimes over there by that mailbox. I don't know why the weeds just grow there. And, and, and so I, I start pulling them or I sweep, you know, off something that I see that I just want to be nice when you get here. And, and, and my temptation is on the one side, you know, hurry up and get this done so that nobody sees you. But can I be honest with you? And, and this is just, I am a worm. I mean, I am just a worm. Sometimes I think, well, you know, if I take my time doing this, maybe somebody will drive up. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I do that. That's abominable. Well, I mean, I, I want to get it done, but part of me hopes you see it. And see, now you see why I almost didn't give this example? Because I just, I just played my hand to you. But I'm trying to be honest before you. It's a real thing. And you know what? Probably you can identify something in your life where you're the same way. And so I give that to you to help you maybe identify it. Stop doing it. Because I want you to benefit from this text just like Jesus has given this. Although it's obvious for a reason. I want your giving to be and doing to be real too. So let's make some textual observations about this this morning. Alms giving and doing good is presumed all through this text. It is what is expected of us to do. Um, I am so grateful for the people, that, and I say this as a blanket statement, uh, the people of Hunters Creek, we have people who, who do give. And they give, you know, sometimes I'm just amazed. And we have a lot of people who do, forgive me, Lisa Bag Daddy, do. I mean, they do things all the time. They're like always here. And when I first got here, I won't mention this person's name, but I thought, should this person be on staff? You know, they're always here. They're working and doing something. I know everybody can't do this as a retired person. And I know he'll get mad at me if I mention his name, so I won't. But, but there's people like that. Man, I'm so grateful for this church, the people who give and the people who do here. And if they do it here, I, I would bet a dollar to a donut they're giving in anthropy and our benevolence because every good thing that we can give to is not necessarily something we should give to. I, I'll just tell you, like I, for, for me personally, I rarely give to anything other than the local New Testament church. 
I do almost all of my giving through here. I would love to give to wounded warriors and some other things, but I can't afford everything I'd like to give to, right? Work of God in this kingdom now for the souls and his honor and glory. It's, as much as those people are needy than I am, honestly, about anything else. Because souls matter most. Amen? Souls matter most. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Okay? There are various types of giving, and I won't read these texts, but you can give you some examples. Physical helps. Um, in Luke chapter 11, verse 41, and Luke 12, verse 33, uh, 33. conduct, ministry of, of, of works, uh, Dorcas in Acts chapter 9, verse 36, she did good deeds, um, our benevolence, um, Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, and the reason I use that one as an example is that he, as the heart of a man, was doing good for the Jewish nation and God honored it. That's significant. It's the re reason I say that is because, let's take Greg. You know, you go off into a mission field somewhere, and it, it may very well be because somebody like a Cornelius was doing, and they were looking for that real God, and God answered their prayer and brought them a missionary. I believe God does that. God honored him. Our charity should not be either applauded or avoided. Too often it is avoided because of our materialism. You know, I, I, I don't, I've had people say to me before, I can't do, and I'll fill in the blank, because they fill in the blank. You know, they went out to eat every day for lunch, and they always had a new Honda Accord every two years, and whatever, and so they couldn't do some things that were spiritual, and they said they were Christians, and they knew they should do, because they couldn't afford it. Where's your priorities? Well, where do you really want your money to go? And now that we're talking about money. So it shouldn't be avoided, but it shouldn't be applauded either. Um, there is um, a, sense, a sense of sincerity that God honors when we do things to him and for him. Um, I, you, let's take, for example, like a, um, a Bill Gates or an Oprah Winfrey or anybody else, you name it. They've got theirs. They, they can give millions, they can give billions, they can give trillions and give whatever they want. They've got theirs. They, they get the receipt, paid in full, here's yours, it's now, it's done. Psst, no more. Because it wasn't for Christ. And yet, there'll be multitudes, no doubt, in heaven who didn't give a fraction of what those people gave. They were unheard of people. And yet, their rewards will be voluminous in eternity because it was real. And the object was God. So how can we respond to this text? Well, one, uh, we can give. Uh, we can give personally, and you should give personally. You can do, and you should do personally. Like I said before, some people have the gift of, of maybe dollars, and some people have the gift of painting, or whatever the case. Uh, those both can be used, and they should be used, whatever God's given you. But in the end, God gives to every man individually as he will. So you have something to give. Let me say that again. You have something to give, something to do. As charity is assumed here in this text by Jesus to his hearers, um, we accept that this is part of our faith too. We read that in a sermon a couple of weeks ago. It must be. I'm going to start the closing with, with this. Uh, Jesus says that these people get their praise in verse 2. That word praise is where we get the term doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, ye creatures here below. You're right, you know the doxology, right? Doxa. Uh, but uh, 
they in verse 2 want it from the man and in Matthew 5 it's supposed to be given all praise all praise to God all praise man deserves none of it I remember um, Dr. I think it's Dr. Bob Jones III who said do not sacrifice the eternal on the altar of the immediate. Do not sacrifice the eternal on the altar of the immediate. And you know, that's what we do when we seek man's fanfare in our giving and in our doing. So Christian, are you charitable? Are you exercising righteous needs and deeds and towards people? Does it come from a heart of compassion or an obligation or self-serving will? To the unconverted person, if you're in here and you're not saved, <clears throat> let me just say to you that God did something, as I said earlier, very publicly, but, but, but with all humility, God humbled himself to become a man. And he took on all of the, the sin of man. And he was crucified very publicly painfully and shamefully so that all the world might see this greatest act of love and passion, this greatest of all charitable deeds was done on the cross for our sin. And you just can't talk about charity and giving without talking about God's charity and His giving. And it's not that we deserved it. It's because for whatever reason, God loved us. And He did it because He too knows He is the object of all honor and glory. And that's why Ephesians 2, 7, that in the ages to come, he might so show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us. Who's he going to show it to? All of creation. What, what's the purpose? God can look out through all of eternity and all of creation. Here's what he's going to do. He's going to say, look what I did. You say, well, wait a minute. That's totally in contrast to this text. Well, let me ask you this. Who else is God going to glorify? God is God. He deserves all honor and glory. He is the one who did this. He is the one who's worthy of it. And if he gives it to somebody else, it's an act of idolatry on his part. There's no one else to get it. So let me ask you this in conclusion. If you're an unconverted person, if you're a converted person, uh, just think about this text. I, I hope that you'll be sincere in your giving and doing. If you're an unconverted person, if you're unsaved, um, you're just really not doing you much good to, to do religious stuff. It doesn't matter. So keep your money. Save your time. But... Um, you, in, if you don't give yourself to Christ, you're going to rob God of His glory. And you're going to pay for it for eternity because you'll be separated from God in a place called hell that wasn't made for you. It was made for the devil and his angels. That's what the Bible teaches us very clearly. And quite honestly, I don't want you to go there. I've tried to be very transparent and honest with you this morning. But I can't, I can only do so much. I can't do everything for you. 
So what will you do with this text? Christian, what will you do with this text? An unconverted person, what will you do with this text? Let's stand and we're going to be closing in prayer. I want to thank you for being here today. I know we don't ever do that, do we? Breaking the mold. It's good to not be religious, amen? I do want to encourage you to come back tonight, though, for our uh, King's Kids presentation. I think you're going to benefit from it. I encourage you to invite some folks and be praying in the meantime, as Joel said, because we expect there'll be some unconverted people here and we want them to, to know Christ. Father, thank you for giving to us. And in your giving, you did forgive those who will come to Christ honestly and sincerely. Father, I pray that all of our doing, all of our actions would be honest and true before you. We, we just cannot deceive you. You will not be fooled. You see the hearts of man. Father, if there's anybody out here who in their giving and doing or for salvation is trying to pull the wool over your eyes, they're really not one of your sheep. I pray that you'll prick their heart. That you'll let them know that you know and that they would be sincere in their profession and in our conduct. Lord, use this text for your honor and your glory and your people's benefit. Let us learn from it. I ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed and hope to see you tonight.